morning and welcome to worship this third Sunday of Easter. Yes, it is still Easter. Um, I only have some of the announcements, mostly the ones that aren't in your bulletin. So one thing I want to tell you about is that next Sunday is the Sunday the church celebrates Earth Day, which is actually, I think, the day after that on the 22nd, but the church celebrates it on the nearest Sunday, which is the 21st. So we will be doing some Earth Day things. But just so you know, um, I'll make sure there's something in the newsletter, but the focus of Earth Day this year is on plastics and their impact on the environment and our bodies. So uh, we'll be getting you some information about that. And um, there are, I don't see people sitting here, but I'm pretty sure there are things that need to be announced. Sharon? Um, so those of you who are signed up for CPR after church today, um, and if you're not signed up, there are a couple people who are sick and couldn't come, so there will be space if you want to come anyway, which would be, which would be fine. Um, I also, I'm trying to thank all the wonderful people who do things around here, and I want to thank the kitchen committee for all the wonderful committee cookies after church for Other announcements that need to be made before worship. Okay. Meanwhile, if you're visiting with us today, we're really glad you're here. We want you to know that everyone is welcome at communion. And uh, we will give instructions, I'll give instructions when the time comes. Um, just know that we practice Eucharistic hospitality and everyone is welcome. We begin our worship with our focus on the baptismal font uh, in front of the doors. Please rise. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Just as God's work of creation never ends, so the gifts received in baptism are renewed every day. Let us give thanks together for the life given in baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for the waters of life, for water to bathe in, water to drink, for waters to play in and waters that inspire wonder. For water that gives life to our planet. We give thanks to God for the waters of life. We give you thanks, O God, for the waters of this place. For water from our tap. For rain. For aquifers and well fields. And for the Dungeness River. We give thanks to God for the we give you thanks for your salvation through water, for delivering Noah and his family through the flood waters, for leaving your people, ancient Israel, through the sea into freedom, for preserving your prophet Elijah through the time of drought, for guiding your people across the Jordan into a new land, for quenching the Samaritan woman's thirst with living water. We give you thanks for your we give you thanks for the life of all the baptized and for all who gather here, for godparents and baptismal sponsors, for children and grandchildren, for our siblings in Christ whom we have never seen but to whom we are bound. We give you thanks for the life We give you thanks for life in Christ through your Holy Spirit, for our entry into Jesus' death through these waters, for our new birth into a life of freedom and service, for our calling to be your people sent out for the life of the world. We give you thanks, blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Our gathering song is the Day of Resurrection, ELW number 361. That's in the Cranberry Book. Shut up. 
the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the peace of victory for God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Worthy is Christ the Lamb who was slain whose blood set us free to be people of God. This is the feast of victory for God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Power, riches, wisdom, and strength and honor and blessing and glory are Christ. This is the feast of victory for God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing, honor, glory, and might to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. For the Lamb who was slain has begun to reign. Hallelujah. This is the feast of victory for God. Hallelujah. 
Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, you are the author of life, and you adopt us to be your children. Fill us with your words of life that we may live as witnesses to the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Sovereign, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from the third chapter of Acts. Peter addressed the people saying, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by your own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified God's servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though Pilate had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in Jesus' name, Jesus' name itself has made this man strong, whom you see now and know, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Now, friends, I know you acted in ignorance and did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what God had foretold through all the prophets, that the Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. And we'll read Psalm 4 responsively. See how good, how pleasant it is for God's people to live together as one. It is like precious oil on Aaron's head, running down on his beard, running down to the collar of his robes. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You set me free when I was in distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You mortals, how long will you dishonor my glory? How long will you love illusions and seek after lies? Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. The Most High will hear me when I call. Tremble then and do not sin. Speak to your heart in silence upon your bed. Offer the appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the God. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O God. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when grain and wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Most High, make me rest secure. The second reading is from the first letter of John, chapter 3. See what love Abba God has lavished on us in letting us be called God's children. Yet in fact, yet that in fact is what we are, what we are. The reason the world does not recognize us is that it us is that never recognized God. Dear my dear friends, we are now God's children but it has not been revealed what we are to become in the future. We know that when it comes to light, we will be like God, for we will see God as God really is. All who keep this hope keep themselves pure, just as Christ is pure. Anyone who sins at all breaks the law, because to sin is to break the law. Now you know that Christ, who is sinless, appeared to abolish sin, but whoever continues to sin has never seen or known Christ. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. To live a holy life is to be holy, just as Christ is holy. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please rise to welcome the gospel. Christ your home shall we go. You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy
Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, Why are you frightened and why do you doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And having said this, Jesus showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, Jesus said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me and the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. It's the third Sunday of Easter, and we have now heard Easter stories from Mark, John, and Luke. What they have in common is that in each account, Jesus' followers were what? Pardon? Skeptical? They were definitely skeptical. They were afraid. They were afraid. In Mark, after the women at the tomb heard the good news of Jesus' resurrection, they fled in fear and, as the gospel lesson ends, said nothing to anyone. In John, the disciples were gathered behind locked doors because of their fear, both on Easter Day and again a week later, even after encountering the risen Christ. And now today, Luke tells us that the disciples were gathered in Jerusalem discussing news of the resurrection when Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And they were startled and terrified. Like last week's lesson from John, today's lesson from Luke deals with the disciples' doubt. In Mark, the disciples seem to have been afraid of what would happen to them, which was a perfectly reasonable thing to be afraid of. In John, they were afraid of the Jews, which just can't be taken at face value because they were all Jews. So something else was going on there. Luke tells us that although some of them had actually encountered the risen Christ already, the disciples had gathered there in Jerusalem and were startled and terrified because when Jesus appeared among them, they believed him to be a ghost, to have no substance. After all, according to both John's account and Luke's, the risen Christ was able to appear and disappear before the disciples' eyes, even behind closed doors, even behind locked doors. However, the risen Christ still bore the wounds of the crucifixion and ate food at their table. Do you find this confusing? Do you wonder about the paradox it seems to present? Does it raise doubts in your mind? Way back when I was an intern, which was a very long time ago indeed, I was asked to lead an adult forum in a series about resurrection, so I did. And like those disciples, I was terrified. I had my outline and my notes all in order, and I knew the material backwards and forwards, and a good 60 people had turned out for this forum that first day. 
As I said, I was more than a little nervous as I stood before them at the lectern. I decided that, as a discussion starter, I'd have them answer a brief survey about their understanding of resurrection. Now, this wasn't a survey I'd made up myself. It was crafted by some seminary professor somewhere, I don't remember where, and used fairly commonly all across the US. Um, what I was hoping for was the opportunity to acknowledge that in any group, including my internship congregation, there were bound to be areas of common understanding and areas of difference in understanding regarding Jesus' resurrection and actually any number of things. I mean, honestly, I could raise any topic right now, and how many of you think you'd all agree? Yeah. And let's, let's face it, it's like that in our families too, right? Even if you have a great marriage, you don't agree all the time. So this survey included about 10 statements, and one was to respond by circling agree or disagree. Somewhere towards the end of the survey was a statement that read something like, I believe Jesus' body was physically restored to life. And as everyone was busily circling answers, one woman spoke up and blurted out, anyone who would even ask such a, Christian, a question isn't even Christian. Uh-oh. <laughs> right away, a couple of the others chimed in to agree with her. If anybody had a different opinion, it wasn't voiced because it wasn't okay. By her statement, that woman had effectively shut off discussion before it had begun, and my supervisor decided it was best to end that series then, rather than to even have discussion because of how it had started. What a learning experience. The reality is, the gospel stories don't all agree. The gospel stories were each written in a particular historical and social context with particular audiences in mind. The sacred stories come to us through the lenses of their authors. Each of us receives sacred story through their own lens or filter that includes language, customs, beliefs, beliefs, education, and the individual's history. No two of us receive these stories exactly the same way. Some will believe that Jesus of Nazareth was resuscitated, that his same physical body became reanimated uh, and was just like it was before. Others would argue that Christ's resurrection is not historical at all, but metaphorical. And still others hold that in the resurrection, Jesus was transformed, that his resurrection, resurrected body had substance and was continuous with the body of his earthly ministry, yet was something more. That is the Lutheran understanding, but it may not be your understanding. And there are other understandings. So... Do we need to agree on how Jesus was resurrected for it to be true? I see a lot of you shaking your heads no. Do we need to come to some sort of consensus to be one community of faith? No. I don't think so. How Jesus was resurrection is not central to any of the gospel accounts. And as Lutherans, we know we're saved by what? Grace. We're saved by grace, not by being right. <laughs> so, sure, it's interesting to consider and discuss how Jesus was resurrected, how various things happened. But it's important that we not let us let these discussions keep us from missing the central points of each gospel writer's, uh, the central point the gospel writer's trying to make, wants to convey about what the resurrection means for those who would follow. That's what the gospel writers care about. Not the how, but what does this mean? And that's a good Lutheran question, right? 
Our gospel lesson today is actually the second time in Luke's narrative that the disciples encounter the risen Christ. And both encounters follow the same pattern. Jesus appears, but the disciples don't recognize him immediately. Jesus addresses the issue of the disciples' doubts, explains scripture, and then food is eaten. These elements together help us understand not only who the resurrected Christ is, but who we are. What's central in both these stories is the renewal of table fellowship. Jesus explains the scriptures, but guess what? He isn't recognized. Fear and doubt are overcome only when bread is broken and fish is eaten. Throughout his ministry, Jesus was found to be eating with his followers and with all manner of unlikely folks. Fish played a predominant role in Luke's gospel. According to Luke, a significant number of Jesus' followers were fisher folk by profession, and a great deal of their table fellowship involved eating fish. Certainly the miracle stories about the feeding of the multitudes extend the idea of table fellowship involving fish to everyone in Jesus' vicinity. The eating of fish was so central to table fellowship Jesus shared with his followers that the fish became a sign by which persecuted followers could declare their allegiance to the way. That's what they called themselves. They didn't call themselves Christian. In Greek, the letters that spell out the word for fish form an acronym. The first letters of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, spell out the word fish. So the word fish, or even a picture of a fish, became a code, a way for Christians to identify one another. Now I know in the 70s it kind of became a code for how to identify the right kind of Christian, but that's a whole different story. It really was important 2,000 years ago. Table fellowship was central both in Jesus' teaching ministry and in that con the continuation of that ministry after Easter. And certainly, table fellowship is as important to ministry today as it was 2,000 years ago. Today, in our ever more impersonal world in which everything is automated, and the marginalized dehumanize more than ever, table fellowship restores our common humanity and sharing food with one another in an atmosphere of compassion and openness, we experience the risen Christ in a very direct way. That's why when Lutherans get together to worship, we have refreshments. What would happen if there were no coffee? <laughs> I'll digress for a second, but it's a funny story. Before I was an intern, I was a teaching parish student, just like everybody else. That means you're assigned to a congregation. And you're supposed to just live with that congregation and be a part of it and learn a little bit of worship leadership. Well, so I signed up to make coffee. I had no idea you had to plug that thing in two hours in advance. So, so just, before, just before the service of the table, I got up and I plugged it in. And we got to the end of the service and it wasn't ready. And it wasn't ready for another hour. And so we had a huge room full of grumpy Lutherans. So I thought preaching was going to be the hardest thing. Anyway, Lutherans very rarely get together for worship without sharing some sort of table fellowship. And we do that midweek, not just on Sundays, right? In fact, clergy are like this, right? We have a ministerial association meeting. What do we do? We bring our lunch. We have a meeting with the bishop. On Zoom, what do we do? We bring our lunch. Even when the risen Christ appeared in, the person, in person to the disciples and explained scripture to them, they didn't recognize him until he broke bread, until uh, he shared a meal at their table. 
So consider this. Those who knew Jesus during his ministry before Easter didn't recognize him after Easter when he explained the scriptures to them until he shared table fellowship with them. So now, 2,000 years later, when we did not know Jesus personally before Easter, how can we expect that others will recognize Christ's presence in us when we explain scripture to them unless we follow Christ's example and share table fellowship with them? A while back, actually several years back, the new director of St. Vincent's Free Dining Room in San Rafael, California, transformed the ministry there. For decades, the dining room had been a place hungry people went for a hot meal, uh, served by gloved volunteers on the other side of a pass-through window, and that ministry was supported ecumenically. Sue changed the procedure. Volunteers were encouraged to sit down and share the meal. The window disappeared. Clergy of many denominations began dropping in for meals. She asked them to just come have lunch here. So they began dropping in for meals. The priest, the rabbi, the lo local pastors. Relationships were formed, and in the fellowship they shared, volunteers, clergy, and those who had come for a free meal began to recognize the Christ presence in one another. So take a moment now and remember a time when you shared a meal with someone and experienced that Christ presence. A time when you know that you were blessed. My experience is that the people here at DVLC know how important table fellowship is. You want to invite hungry people, lost people, lonely people to break bread with you and join the table fellowship, to be participants in the community. So now remember a time when you invited someone to break bread with you. In our lesson, the risen Christ tells those first disciples that the good news is to be proclaimed to all peoples. Being an Easter people means actually developing relationships with people. It doesn't mean just serving food to hungry people through a window or by passing out a lunch, but by actually sitting down together. People are hungry beyond their need for food. Hunger for community. Hunger for justice. Hunger for safety. Hunger to be seen as people of value. And yet those hungers intrinsically are linked to breaking bread with others. We're to follow Christ out into the world where real people live their real lives. We know we're the body of Christ, but if we follow the path of least resistance and just sit tight in our little building, which Lutherans do really well, doing a lot of charity inside the walls, waiting for people to show up, only a very few people will experience the Christ presence. This week, I invite you to notice the ways in which God is calling this congregation to broaden its table fellowship further than ever before, so that even people who do not knock on our door experience the Christ's presence and receive the good news that they are radically loved and accepted. Thank you.
please rise? Our song is 469. Food of angels, heaven's bread For these gifts we did not labor By your grace we have been fed By somebody blessed and broken Cup of flowing life outpoured Give us a living token of your word redeemed, restored. In this meal we taste your sweetness, bread for our good wine of peace, holy word and holy wisdom, satisfy our deepest needs. Somebody blessed and broken, Cup of flowing life outpoured. Give them a living token of your word redeemed, restored. Send us now with faith and courage to the rock, past retreat in our living and our dying. We become what we receive A body blessed and broken Cup of flowing life outpoured Give us a living token As your world redeemed, restored Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news, saying, God of grace, hear our prayer. O oh God, our Holy One, you feed our deepest hungers. As we share the holy meal that is the body and blood of Jesus given for us, lead us to share all that we have and find in generosity abundant life. God of grace. God, our creator, you bring forth all life on earth. Calm storms bring water to parched places and protect the climate that this planet would sustain life in all its variety. God of grace. God, our Savior, you offer wisdom and guidance beyond all human knowledge. Instruct lawmakers, judges, and elect elected officials to make decisions grounded in your justice and care for all people. God of grace. God, our elder, you care for all your children. Encourage those who are in times of transition, facing the loss of old ways and routines and anticipating change. Guide those who journey in grief, hope, and uncertainty. God of grace. Oh God, our center, you bring all people together in you. Help us to remember our identity and purpose in our ministry here in Squim. Move us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to share in beloved community. God of grace. For what else do God's people pray? For all these things spoken aloud and in the silence of our hearts, God of grace. O oh God, our resting place, your Son Jesus Christ promised that we are held in your love forever. We remember our beloved to have died, 
especially Elsa and Doris. We remember and share their love. As we remember and share their love, comfort those who mourn. God of mercy. We entrust all our prayers to you, gracious God. Receive them by the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ, our sovereign. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share a sign of that peace with one another. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Pat. Peace be with you. Congratulations on your uh, solar panels, right? Yeah. Um, what kills me, though, is we, for about six months of the year, we pay the PUD over 40 bucks for the privilege of sending them electricity. It just, I mean, it was much better in Fresno where we actually didn't pay anything. It's, it's changing there, too. It, the, the lobby is powerful. talk about that more. Whoops. God's peace be with you. Peace be with you. worship with our offerings. Word. Rise then to spread abroad God's mighty word. 
Jesus risen will bring in the kingdom. Jesus risen will be in the kingdom. Let us pray together. Be known to us, O Christ, in the breaking of the bread. As you were made known to the disciples, receive these gifts and the authoring of our lives, that we may be your risen body in the world. Amen. May God be with you. you for creating the heavens and the earth. We praise you for bringing Noah and his family through the waters of the flood, for freeing your people, ancient Israel, from the bonds of slavery, and for sending Jesus to be our Redeemer. We give you thanks for Jesus, who living among us healed the sick, fed the hungry, and with a love stronger than death, gave his life for others. In the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, Jesus' life-giving death and glorious resurrection, we await your promised life for all this dying world. Amen, come, sovereign Jesus. Breathe your spirit on us and on this bread and cup. Carry us in your arms from death to life, that we may live as your chosen ones, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Amen, come Holy Spirit. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Creator, now and 
gathered into one in the Holy Spirit, we pray together in the manner of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We will receive communion at the front of the aisle. Please come at the direction of the usher. You may receive either regular bread from me or gluten-free bread from someone who I hope will come forward now because we don't have an assisted minister. You may, thank you, you may choose either a cup of red wine or a cup of gold grape juice. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Come, be filled with light and life. All are welcome at God's table. I have gluten hands.
the body of Christ given for you. 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 The body of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's death and resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of heaven to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to Jesus' resurrection that we may show your glory to all the world through the same Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. May God, who has brought us from death to life, fill you with great joy. Almighty God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our sending song is Rise, O Church, Like Christ Arising, ELW 548. Ciao!
grow in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thank you. Thank you.